Hi, my name is Parm Delay, and I'm a gastroenterology fellow at the University of California, San Diego. Today I'll be discussing our recently published systematic review entitled The Risks of Serious Infection or Lymphoma with Anti-TNF Therapy in Pediatric IBD. Anti-TNF therapy is an effective treatment option for pediatric IBD, but treatment is often delayed until patients are felt to be sick enough to warrant the risks of therapy. The adverse events of greatest concern are the risks of serious infection, lymphoma, and death. The majority of the existing data, however, are from small pediatric studies, adult IBD data, or non-IBD patients exposed to anti-TNF therapy. Therefore, a clear assessment of treatment-related risks in pediatric IBD is lacking. Thus, we performed a systematic review to quantify the incidence of these adverse events and then compared these rates to those seen when utilizing other treatment options for pediatric IBD, anti-TNF therapy in adult IBD, and the general pediatric population. We followed the PRISMA standards for systematic reviews and identified a total of 65 studies for inclusion, which reported on 5,528 patients with a total of 9,516 patient years of follow-up. Important points to highlight here are the small percentage of studies which had a mean per patient follow-up of greater than two years, and the minority of patients exposed to adalimumab therapy as compared to infliximab therapy. This therefore limits our ability to accurately assess long-term risks or greater than two-year risk of therapy or compare risks between the two anti-TNF agents in pediatric IBD. There were a total of 309 serious infections equating to an incidence of 325 per 10,000 patient years. When limiting this analysis to prospective studies to overcome the reporting bias seen with retrospective studies, the incidence rate was actually similar at 352 per 10,000 patient years. There were a total of two lymphomas equating to an incidence of 2.1 per 10,000 patient years of follow-up, and the incidence of Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma were similar. The incidence of death with anti-TNF therapy was 5.3 per 10,000 patient years of follow-up, and the majority of deaths were attributed to infectious etiologies, with a single death occurring secondary to a cardiac arrhythmia in a patient with a pre-existing condition. When we compare these rates to those seen with alternative treatments for pediatric IBD, we see that the rate of serious infection and lymphoma with pediatric anti-TNF therapy is similar to that seen when utilizing immunomodulator monotherapy in pediatric IBD. The rate of serious infection with steroid use, however, is significantly higher than that seen when utilizing anti-TNF therapy in pediatric IBD patients. It should be noted here that we did not have an ideal group for comparison, and our rates of serious infection with steroid use are extrapolated from those seen when using steroids in another pediatric inflammatory condition, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. This cohort used for this analysis had a risk of serious infection of approximately 350 per 10,000 patient years when utilizing anti-TNF therapy, suggesting that their baseline risk is similar to pediatric IBD patients. When comparing rates of adverse events with anti-TNF therapy in pediatric IBD to those seen in adult IBD patients exposed to anti-TNF therapy, we see that the rate of serious infection is higher in adult IBD patients as compared to pediatric patients. The rate of lymphoma and death are slightly higher in the adult population, but this did not reach statistical significance, and it should be noted that the adult studies in these analyses were largely randomized control trials with a larger follow-up period and a more rigorous monitoring process. Finally, the rate of lymphoma with anti-TNF therapy in pediatric IBD is similar to that seen in the general pediatric population, even after adjusting for lymphoma subtypes. There were no cases of hepatosplenic T-cell lymphoma reported in the manuscripts included based on our methods, and cases of hepatosplenic T-cell lymphoma have not been collected systematically with a known denominator. Therefore, it was not possible to calculate an incidence of comparison between these two groups. So these data help to highlight several important considerations for providers and patients. First, there appeared to be no increased risk for lymphoma with anti-TNF therapy in pediatric IBD when compared to other therapies for pediatric IBD or adult IBD patients exposed to anti-TNF therapy. This helps to reassure us regarding the risks of therapy, but we should keep in mind 
that the lack of evidence does not apply a lack of risk, and further prospective studies are needed to confirm these findings. Second, the risk of serious infection with anti-TNF therapy in pediatric IBD was actually much lower than that seen with steroid use for pediatric IBD or anti-TNF therapy in adult IBD. This helps to highlight two major considerations. Perhaps we shouldn't be waiting to use anti-TNF therapy until patients are older because the risk of serious infection may increase with age and disease duration. And second, the steroid sparing property of anti-TNF therapy may actually help to reduce the overall risk of serious infection in these patients. Given that, the majority of deaths attributed to anti-TNF therapy were actually secondary to serious infections. This helps to highlight that anti-TNF therapy may actually reduce the overall morbidity and mortality in pediatric IBD. Overall, providers should feel reassured that anti-TNF therapy is a safe and effective treatment option in pediatric IBD. And although there are some risks with therapy, the overall rate of these serious risks and adverse events is actually very low. We would like to thank the AGA and CGH for allowing us to present these data and hope these data help providers better communicate the risks and benefits of these therapies when attempting to administer them in pediatric IBD. Thank you.